Well, here we are in Chicago, Illinois, and I'm here with my friend and fellow combat veteran, Terry Lane. And Terry, thank you so much for taking your time out and coming and visiting with us today. And uh, I think I'm going to start the interview today with just asking you, where were you born and raised? Sure. Um, so I was born in a small town, Carrollton, Illinois. But I grew up in Jerseyville, which is like 15 miles down the road. They didn't have a hospital at that time. Um, I grew up, so I grew up there and uh, went to high school there. And just It's about 45 minutes north of St. Louis, Missouri. Okay. And what was it like growing up in those days? Um, well, probably simpler. You know, high school was lots of fun for me. And uh, um, it was a fairly large high school. It was like 1,100 people. In fact, then a pretty good-sized high school. Mm -hmm. But uh, had a lot of fun. Worked at a grocery store. Um, just had a good time. Any brothers or sisters? I have an older brother and an older sister and a younger sister. What are their names? So my older sister is uh, Sharon, my older brother and my brother is Roger, and my younger sister is Kathy. Okay. And tell us a little, a little bit about your folks. Um, Mom and Dad. Um, Dad worked as a mechanic his whole life. Uh, worked on farm machinery and uh, trucks and things like that. And uh, Mom didn't work until we pretty much got out of the house, and then she had a job, worked as a cook at, um, I think it was the elementary school, then the high school. Oh, okay. Yeah. She, yeah. she loved working and uh, wished she had worked more, but she was a stay-at-home mom and did a good job of that. Which in our generation, that was a lot of our moms, do. that's what they did. That's what they did, right? You, you betcha. Yeah. In, did you volunteer for the service, or were you drafted? I volunteered, but um, back then, I was a student at the time. I'd been to college for two years already, had a student deferment, and... Um, Did you get your two-year degree? No, I was in a four-year school. I mean, but, oh, okay, but yeah. did you get the first two years done? No, I was in a four-year program, so uh, I just left school, uh, gave up my deferment, and enlisted for two. So that was then, that was that program where you could go in yep. and say, I know it's going to happen eventually. I'll just go ahead and go in now and yeah. And now, did you get an RA? Yes. Okay, so you were uh, regular army. Yeah. yeah. Okay, good. Which was different. I mean, uh, that was very different back then. Yeah. Most everybody's going in for at least three. Yeah. 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 The, but a lot. Of, you'd be surprised how many guys took advantage of that. Yeah. A lot of the of our guys that we served with went in on that. Yeah. go in and say, hey, I know it's going to happen sooner or later, so I'll, I'll volunteer to yeah. go in. I think for me at the time, um, and looking back, I don't know exactly how I made that decision, but uh, I didn't feel like I was probably doing as well or was committed enough to school. I mean, I was in school, I had a deferment, but I was just kind of unsure about how things were uh, personally. And then I saw everything about the Vietnam War, and I guess I had felt a little um, patriotic at the time. And uh, so I um, made the decision to go in. My parents, you know, just couldn't believe it, and I guess it was harder on them than I thought. But, yeah. Uh, yeah. That, w that was my next uh, comment. I was going to ask you how your family felt about, about you going into the service, and yeah. especially about, you know, going to Vietnam. Yeah, they were um, pretty religious people and um, didn't like the idea of war or anything like that mm -hmm. and certainly didn't want me to be in that same kind of situation. Sure. How, and how old were you when you enlisted? 19. Oh, so you were 19. Okay. And I think your situation is kind of like mine. I, I went to college mm -hmm. right out of high school because mm -hmm. my dad wanted me to do that. Yes. And I was kind of burned out. Mm -hmm. I mean, to be honest with you, I. Probably, it probably wasn't my first priority. Yeah. And so after I had gone for a year, I decided it was more important to make money and chase girls, and maybe not in that order, but, mm -hmm. uh, and then I lost my deferment, and yeah. that wasn't so smart. Yeah. And I, I got drafted. They nailed me. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, I didn't realize that once you quit college, the college was obligated to Pretty tell cool. the selective service of all That's males right. that dropped out of, and, That's right. and you went right to the top of the yeah. right to the top of the list. Yeah, there is a system, it worked. Yeah. <laughs> now were you married or engaged 
when you nope. went to Vietnam? No. Nope. Uh, any uh, relationships? Any girlfriends? I had or? a girlfriend, yeah, that actually pretty much survived Vietnam and uh, uh, until afterwards, several years, but uh, didn't uh, work out long term. But did yeah. she write to you? And, yeah. Oh, so you had a girlfriend back home that you? Yeah, actually stayed my girlfriend, and you know. And you didn't get any Jody letters. No Jody letters. Oh, yeah. that's good. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And uh, she was she what didn't turn out to be your your wife, did she? No, she didn't. Um, we kept in touch over the years, but uh, then finally, just you know. Yeah, w went yeah. your separate ways. Yeah. And where did you go to basic training? Um, Fort Ord, California, which was really odd for us living in this area. Everybody went to Fort Leonard Wood, you know, but. At this time in the process, our group uh, went to Fort Ord. Yeah, I did too. Did you? Yeah, I was there for, for basic and the IT. Me too. Yeah, I yeah. sure was. Yeah, it's kind of like a stepping stone to Vietnam. <laughs> now, were they still <laughs> under quarantine and basic? Oh, the yeah, spinal they meningitis. They yeah, oh they, my they gosh. You had to wear the maggot tags, the white tags. And you couldn't. And you couldn't <laughs> leave. I no. mean, they wouldn't let you. You couldn't leave, leave the them. area unless right. it was for training. Right. Yeah. yeah. And and you know, I, and there was a good reason because they were guys were dying. Yeah, I mean, yeah. For, so I mean, it was. Yeah, I mean, it was pretty serious. You know, one thing that uh, just while I'm thinking here, that the army helped me with was learning about diversity. Um, growing up in a small town, there were like no diverse population, <coughs> all white people, mm -hmm. and went to um, Fort Ord and discovered Hispanic people. You know, and, uh, and Puerto Ricans, and, Puerto Ricans and, <laughs> and, and, and Hawaiians. Yes, there were people yes. there from Twenty uh, Fifth Infantry. Sure, that were you know drill instructors, and so uh, one good thing that the Army did was kind of open my eyes. Yeah, tell me about Basic. When you did, they fly you in there. Did you fly into uh, when you went to Fort Order? Did they bus you, or how did? What was I, the transportation? Yeah, I flew in from Illinois to. Uh, for St. Louis, too. is that what you mean? And to then, Ford, yeah. and then, did they put you on a bus and then bus you to Fort Ord? Yes. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So what I want to know is, is when the bus got on the fort and it stopped, and they opened the doors and they said, "Get your yeah right gear Start and scream and yeah, jump off." Tell me about that. I don't remember enough to tell you, uh, but I do remember it was like something you'd see in a movie. Um, you know, get the off this bus and you know grab and run and jump and you know it was like. Yeah, it was like something out of a movie that you'd see um, the one way they treated people. Of, one of my favorite memories of that, and it wasn't funny at the time. No. But you got a but the, all these guys, and a lot of them were long hairs. Oh, I yes. mean, you know, a lot of them were yeah. hippies at the time. Yeah. And these DIs would say, like, form up. Oh, yeah. And no. guys would, like, look around like, what, what do you, and, guy, and then, so then they'd get in some kind of a get in line. semblance of, yeah. of order. And then they'd say, like, right face, sure. and half the people will turn left. Yeah. I mean, it was just hilarious. You're pretty, right, you're right. Yeah, that was a good one. It was pretty hilarious, actually. So I have one story about basic that I like to tell um, about haircuts. Okay. Because <laughs> you're right, California, a lot of long hair out there at that time, and everywhere else. I mean, sure. I had, my hair was longer then as well, but uh, not that long. But um, uh, so we went in. Uh, to get our first haircuts. I think we got there in the middle of the night or something like that. You always get there in the middle of the night. Yeah. So um, anyway, I guess it was the next day or something like that or a couple of days later, they took us to get haircuts. Of course, there's like these three or four or five small buildings that had, what, two or three barbers in them? Correct. And you lined up yep. outside for as far as you could see, there were troops lined up getting ready to go in. So I was in one of the first, I was in uh, towards the beginning of one of the lines and walked in and of course you then you line around the inside of the building as well and so the guy sat down at, like I said two or three or three or four and they started saying um, just just start cutting their hair you know just like you would get a haircut any place just like you know pulling up and trimming here and trimming and, the, and they, somebody would say just take a little off the sides or... yeah, how do you like it do you like it oh yeah yeah and he said so one guy they were just trimming them up and the guy said uh, you want to keep these sideburns 
He goes, yeah. And he goes, hold out your hand. And he took that oh. right, back, just went, oh. right down the side and just right on the top oh. of his head. Oh. Just shaved oh. him. Oh. 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 <laughs> and from then on, it was 30 seconds. Oh. And everybody was in the chair out. Buddy, I'm telling you. And it was, but it was classic. Yeah. Classic. Yeah, and I remember by the time I got in there, it seemed like there was a foot of hair on the floor. Oh, a little blood I, I every mean, once in a while. Yep, yep. Yeah. <laughs> no kidding. A little scrape. So, tell me about BASIC. What did, what, what did you learn, or what was the course of study, so to speak? <laughs> well, uh, a lot of sand at Ford Ord. So we did everything in the sand, and um, I remember having, having to do the PT to run the mile in the sand, and combat boots and all that kind of stuff. Uh, a lot of uh, chilly mornings with the fog coming in and stuff like that. Uh, a lot of um, um, footlocker inspections and uh, had a couple thrown down the stairwells. And they, mm. The DIs would get upset and throw one down the stairwell. And um, they made uh, not our platoon, but another platoon clean a dumpster with toothbrushes mm -hmm. and stuff like that. I mean. And then they had the contest every week, whoever's bay was the cleanest and all that, you got a sheet cake. Did you guys ever win the... I don't think I ever got, I don't think we did. If we did, I don't remember. Yeah, yeah, that was a competition was between the, okay. the platoons and the company. I don't doubt it. And uh, so, what, what do you remember about going to the individual uh, learning stations and that? Do you remember who <laughs> the instructors were or anything about the instruction at all? Oh, um... We used to go sit in the bleachers, right, and they'd have the little stand out front, and they'd tell you about this particular thing, and then everybody would get and move to the next uh, little area. It's kind of like a sideshow, a yeah. little carnival show. Um, so this may come later, but so I remember that they always get there, and you would have your weapons, and they you sit in the bleachers, and you'd hold them up, and they'd say, "Okay, everybody, fire your weapons," you know, click, click the triggers. Because they always did it when he came out the firing range, you know, click no brass, no ammo. Oh yes, kind of stuff, you know? oh yes. So one day, we sat in the bleachers and the guy pulled his trigger and a round went off. No. Oh man, there were like five DIs grabbed this guy I out of the bleachers. I can't even imagine. Dragged him off. It was like <laughs> everybody was like stunned. I can't and even they, imagine yeah, it. Yeah, it was. It was. <laughs> you know. We laughed at everything, so we laughed at the guy, but it was horrible for him. Sure. Yeah. Did he come back? I mean, I don't even remember. I mean, man, oh man. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that could have been a recycle. Oh yeah. Deal right there. There's another thing, a recycle. Yeah, the people who had to had go chal back. had challenges. Yeah. 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 And uh, so here's one thing that happened to me. Um, well, I was in. I guess it was, it was in AIT. My grandfather died in a car accident, and my parents didn't tell me. Because they knew I'd have to recycle, oh, and it was gosh. like it was at the very end, oh, yeah. like the last couple of weeks of oh, my training, yeah. Yeah. and they waited until I came home on my way to Vietnam to tell me. Well, it's I was well, I always respected them for that. I mean, but it's <laughs> interesting that they would have the, the yeah. foresight to know that if we yeah. drag you out of there, yeah, you're gonna have to flip it. I guess I had told them enough about people having, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. So graduation. Eight weeks. Yep. Fair. Everybody's Basically. sitting around the area, and the first sergeant gets up and he's got a clipboard and mm -hmm. he starts calling guys' names out. Yep. In your unit, in your basic training unit, did everybody think they were going to Vietnam? Mm -hmm. It was a foregone conclusion. Oh, yeah. yeah. So, but you didn't know what your MOS was. No. Okay, and you had taken the battery of tests in the beginning, and they had said how good you scored and undoubtedly you'd be officer material and, right. and the, I mean that whole sure. routine. Right. And so you're thinking, well surely if I'm that good and that smart, I'm not gonna go infantry, they'll put me in as a Clerk. radio a radio operator sure. or, or something. Yeah. So they start reading the names and everybody's eleven B. <laughs> yeah. And, and that's true. Most of them were, and then there were those ones that were thrown in. There would be a truck driver. Every or once, a clerk, a, every or once in a while. Like, what the hell? You know, like what? What's going on? Every here? once in a while, and <laughs> yeah. So um, here's what happened to me personally. I scored really high on the testing that we did. Yes. And um, 
So I was picked to go to um, West Point Prep School, yep. Fort Belvoir, Virginia. And um, so I figured, hey, they're not going to put me in the infantry. I'm going to go to this prep school yeah. and go to West Point. So, um, but I was assigned to level 11 Bravo. And then all through AIT, I will be pulled out for different um, um, interviews and things like that. Are you still interested? You know, blah, blah, blah. And so up until the very end, I thought, I'm not going to go to Vietnam because right. I'm going to go to this school. Um, timing wise, it didn't work out that way for yeah. me. Yeah. Um, so uh, when the orders came, I'm like, oh, well, <laughs> there I go. To Did anybody from the family come for basic training graduation? Too far. Yeah, that, that would have been a stretch. Yeah. Yeah. Remember the parade and marching and remember on the parade field, the graduation uh, ceremony? Kinda, and kinda, yeah. So yeah. it was kind of, yeah. you know, we practiced this for eight weeks that's, that's and now, right. we did. You're right. you know, now we're actually graduating. Yeah. So it was a pretty good feeling of yeah. get, getting through it. Yeah. And then because you were at Fort Ord and, and I was too, I remember you got the weekend off. And then Monday you had to, if you were assigned to AIT at Fort Ord, you showed up at AIT. Yeah. Is that basically what yeah, you Yeah, I didn't have any time in between, right? Yeah. So now you're going to AIT. Mm -hmm. Describe to me what that was like when you showed up for AIT. Well, um, I guess I don't remember it being all that different except more concentrated. In, but since it was you infantry. weren't getting yelled at as much. and I mean, it, they treated you a little bit more... Don't you think they treated you a little better than they did in basic? You know what I don't really remember? Yeah. Um, I I can see where that could be true. Yeah, well, in basic, we were a nothing. Yeah. In AIT, we were something. Mm -hmm. You're on your way to being something. Yeah. You're gonna gonna make, so, we're going to mold you into something. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah I, I remember that. And then the instructors, as I recall, and the DIs in AIT were mostly Vietnam vets. Yes. And a lot of them were, um, uh, several, at least for me, were, were Hawaiian and had been in 25th Infantry. Yeah. Now, wasn't a patch out there also like 9th Infantry or something, the red, white, and blue, like round patch? Is that 9th Infantry? That Oh, that was with an A in the middle of it? it might have had an A, was, or was that just a... That was uh, the, uh, I want to say 5th Army, but I'm not sure. Okay. But we all had that. Yeah, that's, and, yeah okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and so AIT, uh, tell me about that. What was what was that all about? Um, I don't know that I remember anything right offhand that's that's sticking out for me. Got to shoot a lot of different weapons. Yep. Yeah. Did it, yeah. Fifty cal, that kind of stuff. Yeah. Yep. And do you remember the when they got us all out there in the bleachers and they did? the firepower demonstration where all of a sudden artillery rounds start coming in and they're shooting every weapon that is in our arsenal. I don't remember specifically, but I'm sure it happened. Yeah. And, and a helicopter came and a couple of rockets into the old messed up tank. APCs at that time. Yeah. yeah. <coughs> that <coughs> I remember because I thought, man, are we going to kick some butt? We have the firepower. Right? I mean, yeah, yeah. I, you know, and it was, and of course, all the noise and the explosions and yeah, and which was meant. I mean, that was oh, there sure. was a purpose, yeah, you know, yeah. behind that. So and didn't we carry an M fourteen in basic, and a an sixteen in correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Basic basic rifle marksmanship was M fourteen. That's yeah. where you sighted it in, and yeah, and you yeah. qualified. So that was significant to switch to the very significant. Yeah. Yeah, very significant. Plastic. Yeah. I think a lot of people were like, "What?" Yep. <laughs> and and of course, and it didn't. It didn't. You didn't have the recoil yeah. Like, yeah. like the M14 either. Yeah. So, uh, and everybody always wanted to put it on auto, and they oh, threatened yeah. you with your life if anybody did right. that. We learned later that was good training. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and so another thing that I remember was at all the stations, wherever we were at. Mm -hmm. Vietnam vets. Do you do you remember that? And no, they were, it, and a lot of them were guys that had been wounded and you know and so forth. And they were like they were doing the, the end of their duty. In other words, they had. Probably let, let's say that. that a guy got 
hurt six months in Nam, well, he'll have another uh, year, you know, so they would put him in cadre. You know, he's, they put him as an instructor. Sure. And, and, you know, if I didn't think it was serious, if I didn't think that Vietnam was serious, the first place, the first instructor that I saw Vietnam vet, about in the middle of his instruction, he would just, he stopped what he was saying and he started talking about Vietnam mm. and tears were running down his yeah. face and he goes, I don't want one of you guys to get killed. He says, I saw too many guys get, yeah. that's when it hit me. To yeah. see a grown a grown man cry, I mean, right. there's something about that. Yeah. And and I thought and and this one guy he begged us he goes please don't take this lightly. Mm -hmm. He said don't go to sleep on the bleachers. Listen to what these guys tell you. It might save your life. Yeah. And I believed him. I yeah. mean, from that point forward, I was I wanted to learn. You know, yeah. I, basic not so much. Yeah. <laughs> you know, but. Yeah. But uh, so that that's interesting. So you graduate from AIT, and now you're you get your orders and you're going to Vietnam. But before that, they let you have some time off, right? Short time off, yeah. And what did you do with that? Went home, and um, it was right around Christmas time. So because um, I went in in August, so I got out right after, right around Christmas and had to report back like within the first couple of days of the new year or mm -hmm. I, was, I might have even been traveling over New Year's, I can't remember for sure. And, and now the family is really concerned. Oh yeah. I mean, yeah. they were concerned before, but now you've got a uniform. Yeah. And you're actually going to Oakland, California to get on a plane. Yeah. Yeah, so, and again for me, I'm like, any day I'm gonna get this phone call that I'm gonna go to the prep school. You know, they're gonna come get me um, you know, uh, <coughs> this is going to happen. That's almost cruel and unusual. Uh, yeah, yeah. God. And so, uh, and so um, I'm like, well, maybe they'll, you know, they'll stop me before I get there or whatever. Yep. But uh, and you know, look in, re in retro <laughs> hindsight, maybe that was a blessing because if you'd have went to to West Point and you'd have become an officer, guess where you'd have wound up? Yeah, that's true too. Right in Vietnam, but yeah. now you'd have been in charge of a bunch of yeah. yahoos. Yeah, like, like we were. <laughs> That's right. That's right. So, and, and well equipped but ill trained, and with horrible responsibility. Oh yeah. I mean, you know, so maybe it worked. Maybe it worked out in, yeah. You know, in in the long run. Yeah. And so, tell me a little bit of your memory, if you have any, of Oakland when you actually got there, and because we we were there for like a day or two, weren't we? You know what? I don't remember. It's like it's kind of a blur to me. And then when you got on the plane to go to Vietnam, was it a commercial plane? Yeah, it was like Tiger Airlines or something like okay, that. Okay, yeah, I think they were running. Yeah. yeah, and they even had um, flight attendants, yes. stewardesses back then. Right? And you actually got drinks and yeah. snacks and yeah. meals, and which I thought was very strange. Yeah, I had envisioned getting in the back of a C one thirty or something. And, and by the way, some guys, guys did. Some guys some did. <laughs> did you know that? No. Oh. Some guys got that long, long ride in a web seat. Oh wow! And because it was bad enough. And you know what their steward, stewardess, stewardesses were? E one Air Force guys that would bring back lunch, a sandwich, and a piece of fruit or something. Mm -hmm. And that they were when they found out yeah. that the rest of us got to go on United Airlines or to, I, I'll tell you some of some of the guys that I served with were pissed. Yeah. I mean, yeah. when they found that out. Yeah. And then, to insult to injury, when we came home, we were in the line, there's a United Airlines plane here, and one of those military oh, planes no. here. And and it was the luck of the draw. Oh, my. It went, you go there, and you go oh, there. Oh, my. His godfather, Ray Bourgeois, he and I went into the platoon on the same day, and we came out the same day. Wow. We're standing shoulder to shoulder in the line. We get up there. The guy says, Jerry, you go there, and I went to the United. Oh, my. To this day. He never forgave you. Oh, he, I mean, <laughs> anger. Yeah. Just, you know, and because then he described to me when we got home what it was like. Yeah. He goes, they didn't even have seats. There were webs, you know, the oh, seats sure. that hang from the. Yeah. And then he says, and some uh, 
the one Air Force guy comes around with yeah. a bag. <laughs> oh, God. And we're talking hours. Oh, like 20, 20, 20, 20. 20. So I was trying to remember when we left Oakland. Is that where we left from, Oakland? Oh, yeah. So we went to Hawaii. Yeah, some guys and did. And then to yep. Guam. Yeah. And then to Vietnam. That's not yep. right. I think that's what I did. Yep, I did too. We didn't. Some guys went to Alaska. And I think we actually got to got off got off the plane in Hawaii. Got to walk around outside, mm -hmm. but no, do nothing else. Oh yeah, you can't to leave. You can get back on. But I think that's the way I went. Did in. you? Do you remember stopping in Japan on the way over? No. Yeah, well, on our flight. I think I went okay. to Japan, and then did I go to Alaska? You, you very and then well Oakland? could have. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's what I did on the way home. Yeah, the thing I remember about Japan was is when they opened the doors, everybody just turned wet. The humidity and the heat was just oh. unbelievable. Yeah, I have no memory of that at all. Oh, and we didn't get to get off. They, they didn't let us off. Oh, that. I and see. It was a refuel mail sure. deal. Yeah. Probably picking up, you know, whatever. Yeah. So, tell me when the plane lands in Vietnam. <laughs> Benoit, right? Is that where it went? Correct. Benoit, yeah. And they taxi and they stop and they open the door and you get out. Tell me what your impression of Vietnam was. There were there were actually um, mortars uh, landing in the background when I when we got off the plane, and so we walked off and heard this. You know, we're like, what? You know, it's it's happening already. We just got. Off and the you plane. don't have a weapon. No. And so here comes these guys, a, a, a line of people. You know, I forget how many. Long line in jungle gear, uh, dirty, and you know, they were like, you know, yeah, watch out, you know, watch your butt, you know, yeah. all kind of things. And they were getting ready to get on a plane as we were getting off. Yeah, and and some <laughs> some of the looks on their faces oh. was just I, memorable. I most of them didn't talk at all. I remember. Yeah, yeah. most of them that were saying anything was like, hey, watch out, you know, that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so, when you actually, sense-wise, was it, what do you remember when you got off the plane? Was there any pr particular memory of what it felt like or smelled like or? Um, not that I remember, okay. no. A lot, a lot of guys remember the smell of, you know, we were, they would burn all the feces and all uh, that kind of stuff and that always was in the air, Yeah, kind don't, of. Don't remember that offhand, but, um. I think it was a reality check, certainly, getting off a plane, and seeing it was these hot. troops, hot, and, and seeing the mortars hitting in the background. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And then they took us to Long Ben, and that was, I call it the reception station. Yeah. I don't know if that's what it is called, but right. that's what I call it. Yeah. And then we had to stay there for a few days, right? Yeah, I don't remember that either. And really. then they would call, you'd go to the bleachers, listen for your name. And then you'd actually get your orders, and they'd tell you where to where to go. Yeah. Do you, Do you remember that getting your orders? No. <laughs> okay. I really don't. Okay. Well, yeah. you did. Yeah. You, you know, you got your yeah. orders. I got assigned right? someplace. Yeah. And they, if it was like me, they said, "Okay, you're going to the Wolfhounds." Yeah. And the NCO that handed me my orders, as he was handing them to me, goes, "Wolfhounds." He says, "I feel sorry for you." <laughs> that was the last thing he said to me. I heard that later on in life. But yeah. and, and then he said, okay, you're going to go down and there's going to be a uh, deuce and a half. Yeah. And you get there and they'll tell, they'll tell you where, which one's going to Coochie. Yeah. And basically I got a deuce and a half ride from Long Bend to Coochie yeah. with no weapon. Yeah. And I no, guess I did too. They then. had no, all they had was a driver and a co-pilot. And the co-pilot had an M16. Period. And all of us, you know, even though we didn't know each other, everybody was looking at each other and going, wait a minute, we've got to go through Viet through the villages in Vietnam and sure. we don't have anything to protect her. Yeah. Wow. The, and the guy, as we were leaving, he goes, hey, if we get hit, if we get ambushed, lay down on the bottom of the back of the truck. <laughs> we stacked on top of each other. <laughs> so that was, you know, a reality check. Yeah. So yeah. do you remember getting to Coochie? No. <laughs> I really don't. The only thing I remember um, at that point in time, uh, right there before I actually went out to Kotrick, was um, 
getting called in to, to meet Colonel Custer. Oh, yes. Remember Colonel Custer? George Armstrong Custer, the... the and the, I know my was family... Was it the third? I don't remember, I think, but I, I told grandson. my Grandson. Grandson of George Custer. And I'm saying, like, George Custer, and my face like was like ash, and I'm like, you're kidding me. I'm going to, <laughs> under the command of Custer. That's right. Yeah. So, um, and I looked that up years later, and, and I wasn't mistaken. He actually was. It was oh, yes. Custer. Oh, yeah. So he calls me in, and he says, uh, so, here you want to uh, go to West Point. And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> and I was going to say, what am I doing here? Yeah. He goes, well, um, and blah, blah, blah. I don't know if he was a West Point graduate or not. He may or may not have been. I but bet he would be. Yeah. Almost. Just uh, because of his heritage. Yeah, that's what I thought too. But yeah. I don't remember. I won't say that because I'm not 100% sure. But anyway, he said, well, you know, uh, you know, whatever. Take care of yourself. Uh, we'll be in touch or whatever. So that was and my, you're still thinking it's not too late now. Yeah, that was you my... Can, you can drag me out of here any minute. That was minute. my five minutes with him, or two minutes, actually. Yeah. And, um, yeah, then I was back on the path. Yep, and of course they sent you over to supply, and you drew a weapon and gear and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. And when you... Did they helicopter you out to Cotrick or truck? I don't remember. Okay, you got to Cotrick. It must have been... Out there, it must have been helicopter. Yeah. Uh, I would, Pretty far out. I would guess. Yeah. I didn't ride many trucks. Yeah. And so you got there and then they said, okay, your outfit's over there or whatever. Mm -hmm. who, who was the first person or people that you remember? Jeez, I do not remember. Probably a platoon sergeant, you think? Yeah, I don't, I don't remember. Because you would have probably looked him up that, to find yeah. out what you're supposed to do. Yeah, I, I do not remember. What was, what was your first job in the platoon? I guess... Uh, ammo bearer for the 60. So you carried your M16 and some ammo? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And do you remember the first uh, week? Did you go out on day patrol? Did you go on an ambush patrol? I don't remember going out during the day much at all ever. It was almost always ambush patrol. Okay. Night. And did you guys walk to your ambush site? Yes. You'd leave the wire just as the sun was going down? And right. Set up. Then we'd wait till it got dark, then move again. And right. Set up again. Right, right. Do you remember some of the nights being so dark? Oh, yeah. There was no light. There was absence of light. There was nothing in the horizon. There was no light from the city or a village or a town. There was nothing. And so, when you're walking out, when you're moving after you've set up, yeah. did you hold on to the guy's web gear in front of you? That's what we did. No, we did not. I mean, because if you didn't, yeah. and this guy went that way, and this yeah. guy went that way, I mean, it was black. It was it was totally pitch black. Yeah, yeah that's, that's one of the only times the starlight scope didn't work very good. Yeah. Because you got to have some available light. Some light, right. some, some available light. Yeah. So, what was the very first ambush patrol? What do you remember about that? Uh, was it scary to leave the wire and? Well, yeah. Um, I don't. I don't remember um, anything particular about the first one. Did they tell you what to expect? Like your squad leader? Did he say when we get out there, we're going to do this, that, and the other? And... Um, I, probably. I mean, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, we sat up in rice paddies, and you know, I think one of the. Um, eye-opening things was to walk the berms and watch out for explosive devices, you know, mm -hmm. back then, and bungee sticks and stuff oh, like yeah. that, and, you know, um, I guess we did, I'll, I'll finish this now, back up, we did go out sometime during the day, because I remember Soda Kids and... Oh, uh, yes, you know, yes. Like um, so, um, I think one of the real eye-openers from the very beginning was just laying down in the mud and water at night and um, you know there were rats you know running around at night and the uh, idea of and, it and you tend to get very cold laying in the water all yeah. night long yeah yeah one you know two hours on two hours off all night long and um, you know any on the radio. Did, you, did you have any experience with leeches oh every night <laughs> yeah 
Yeah. It's, you know, people don't realize. You look at that, you know, yeah. you just get, gosh darn it. Just take part the insect repellent. Part of doing business, right? You know, get but it just, it was disgusting, wasn't it? Well, walking it? through the canals, too. Oh. You're walking along and then you, poof, you're down in a canal. I mean, you know it's coming, but you just, yeah, you're up to your neck and water and back up the other side and yeah. hold that weapon up in the air. Yeah, you bet. <laughs> so... On one of these occasions that you went on an ambush, do you remember the very first time that there was fire, that there was contact? Um, and what was your, what do you think your impression would that have been? I don't think I remember uh, specifically that incident. Um, do you remember any time that you were out there that there was fire going on? I do remember some, yeah. I remember, um, you know, <coughs> blowing claymores and I had one piece of shrapnel in my uh, chin here. Um, somebody uh, shot their, blew their claymore late. We blew claymores and then we all moved and then this guy flew in. This oh, jeez. <laughs> so I got a piece. I don't think anybody else got anything, but maybe somebody did not anyway. So it was, one of those small things that would just uh, stay there for a week or so that I can eventually pull it out. Oh, yeah, yeah. But, I mean, it could have been bad. Could have went in your eye. Yeah, could have yeah. went in my eye. Uh, little things like that, I mean, you know, knowing that the Viet Cong were, like, walking right out there, and then all of a sudden, you know, boom. It's very different. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, do you remember when one of the guys in your unit, in your platoon, either got wounded or killed? Yeah, yeah. I think the, um, you know, I don't want to get into a lot of detail, but the, the Renegade Woods thing on mm -hmm. April 2nd, that's, that is about the only thing I really remember in terms of that kind of a, an incident, because it was so major. Um, but what were you doing that day? Carrying ammo for Dale Berg. He was the M60 gunner. And um, it was just another walk in the park. Yeah. I mean, as far as you guys were concerned, right? We were out to um, help out some Rangers that got pinned down, and I think they broke off contact. But then they they knew they were still, you know, enemy in the area. I don't think that we knew exactly where they were. That's and <laughs> that was a, you guys were out there in company force that time. Were we? Yeah, not just your platoon. I mean, that was, the, the whole company was okay. Was out there. So yeah. a lot of guys. A lot of guys. Were, a lot of guys going around out there. Yeah. And then, do you specifically remember, did all of a sudden just all hell break loose? Yeah. And, and what do you yeah. recall from on Yeah, so we were, Dale and I were... Um, towards the beginning of the of the uh, contact because you know, there was an opening here we were kind of along a tree line and the they popped their ambush and we could see people like just not that far down from us being hit and so then that's when all hell broke loose our guys our guys yelling medic yeah. and chaos it's it's just chaos isn't yeah it? yeah yeah. And so, did Dale have a position of fire? I mean, was he able to fire? Yes. So yeah. he was he was doing some shooting. Yes. And you were getting your ammo off and right. getting it clipped up and. Right, and that's when, um, not too long after that, then um, this gets real fuzzy back then. Uh, but somehow they needed ammo like the f further up, and so um, this is a few minutes into the firefight. I don't know how long, anyway. Um, time goes by. Yeah. It, time is... Yeah. I, on, on, you can't tell. I couldn't tell. And <clears throat> they were yelling, ammo, ammo, ammo. And so Rios was the other gunner up front. And um, I don't know if he ran out of ammo. I heard maybe his ammo guys weren't, weren't around him. They might have kind of slid away. Um, I don't know what happened there. But... I, I, there must have been another ammo carrier for Dale as well, I can't remember. 
Usually there was two. Yeah, there was two. Yeah. I thought so. I can't remember who that was at the time. But anyway, I looked at Dale and I said, "So, what do you think? Should I go?" And he goes, "Yep, go." So I took off to the front, you know, and um, luckily made it up there. I tell you, it's just it's very surreal, you know, to hear bullets flying through the air. It is and hitting tree limbs and zip zip zip. You know, like it's horrible. But at the time, it was like, hey, it's what you got to do, right? Yeah. So, anyway, I don't want to, you know, have that be the whole story, but um, that was uh, the worst. Did you did you make it up to Rios? Oh, yeah. And so you gave him ammo and so forth? He was forth? dead when I got there. By the time you got there, he yeah. he'd already been shot. Yeah, yeah. So what did you do at that point? You know what? I, I am... I don't think I picked up the weapon. He was still probably like from here to, you know, maybe 20 feet. Okay. I, and uh, he was like under a little clump of trees and I was here. And uh, so I just returned fire with the 16 from there. Yep. That was a, that was a, a horrible day, obviously. Yeah. So yeah. when you actually realized that he was dead, what? Did it put fear in you? Were you numb? I mean... You know, I never did experience that. Um, I don't know. I just didn't. Mm -hmm. um, at the time, it was like I was worried about running out of ammo. I was worried about the barrel melting on my 16, you know, from firing it so much. Mm -hmm. and, you know, every... What were we putting in there? Every third or fifth round of tracer? Yep. And so, um, you know, I was worried about that, and and it, and it all just goes by, doesn't it? I mean, it's yeah. just like you know, we talk about time. Yeah. It could have been five minutes. It could have been five hours, and it just it seems like it's yeah. an eternity, no matter what. Yeah. What it is. It went on so long that I was worried about <clears throat> running out of ammo, and uh, then somebody, I guess it was the company commander, got up and wanted us to all get up and online and walked, you know, on, and I was like, oh my God, this guy's got to be crazy. Online assault. Yeah. It was not the time. <laughs> I hope no. I hope you guys didn't do that. No, some it? people did. And um, he and the RTO and a couple of others, and, and a couple of others, we stood up, but immediately he was shot. Yeah. And so then we had to run out and get him and... You know, it was, yeah. Do you remember at that point, did you realize that you had a lot of guys hurt or killed? I mean, I, did you realize the magnitude? Not the magnitude, no. And no. and was there just lots of shooting going on? Yeah. Just a lot? Yeah. Did you have any Cobras come in, any helicopter support, anything like that? Not for a long time. It seemed like a long time. Yeah, but yeah. I don't remember them actually hitting that area, but they must have um, at some point. And did the rangers that you went to rescue, I'm assuming they probably didn't make it? I think they had already um, disengaged by the time we got there. Oh, I see. I think so, okay. if I remember correctly. And I can't say too much because it's kind of blurry to me, actually. But um, I remember pulling back for a while, and um, we loaded some people on medevacs, and there was a chaplain down in one area talking to people and mm. this this went on for a long time oh yeah this was a bat this was a big battle yeah. yeah and then we had to go back up and you know, it was like yeah and know. that was the worst yeah going back going yeah. having to go back yeah. that was absolutely the worst yeah. yeah yeah and and somebody one of the guys had said that you stayed there that night yeah and that they had were unable to recover some of the right. some of the bodies. Mm -hmm. And do you, do you recall that? Yep, I do recall that. Now that you mention it, yeah, yeah. So you know what? That means that tells me that it was very hairy. Mm -hmm. That whole that and everybody that was at at the Renegade Wood Renegade Wood says, without a doubt, it was probably the worst time they ever had in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. Would you Would you oh, agree with that? For me, it was. Yeah. 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 And so what do you remember about how it ended or how it wound down to the point where you guys actually got out of there? That's kind of the fuzzy part too. Um, 
I don't know. Uh, I kind of lost track of how that ended. And did they send you back to the fire support base then, probably? Yeah, I think. Yeah, I think we had to go back out like the next day or two later. If I remember correctly. Mm -hmm. I did, you know, it seems like we did. Did they send you back into that area? Yeah. Oh my God. I think, we, but everything was pretty much done by then. Right, and the and the NBA were gone. Yeah. Yeah, they were. Yeah. They. they I think we had to walk back through it again. Yeah, I'm pretty sure we did. Yeah. That those every step you took would have been the worst day of your life. Oh yeah. I mean, I I, I know. Yeah. Yep, I know exactly how that yeah. how that is. I think I um, only recently I kind of realized. I think I kind of had a. Um, Kind of a come to Jesus moment on the not in a religious sec, sense, um, life and death, you know, kind of changed for me at that time. Uh. Would you would you describe it as I kind of get it? I kind of know that it might I might just get dead here. Yeah, I kind of accepted the fact. That yeah, I, exactly. Yeah. I, I had that moment in, yeah. in Vietnam at one point where I just, I knew, I mean in my heart, I knew that we were going to get run over and that there was no way that, yeah. I mean, I, I knew I'd do my best, Yeah. but chances are it just it wasn't going to, because there wasn't enough of us. Yeah. You know, there was just too many of them and, and not enough of us. Yeah. <clears throat> and so, yep, that's a great, that's a great comment because that's, that's one that a combat veteran goes through and very, very seldom ever talks about it. I mean, most guys don't ever, you know, because it's hard to articulate. Yeah. It's it's hard to... I think I've looked at, at um, you know, life differently since then, um, you know, because of that. Not always in a good way. And then, and then of course, I think another issue that happens with, with combat vets in that situation is you, once you step back, you start questioning why did they put us in that situation? Yeah. Why didn't they know that there were so many of them? Right. I mean, I mean, you know, let's face it. You yeah. guys got clobbered. <laughs> we did. I mean, let, yeah. I mean, it wasn't like it, shouldn't have been like it that. wasn't like a squad. No. I mean, it there was a company or better. There's probably a couple of companies of NBA right there. Yeah. And uh, so then your trust yeah. issues start. You know, there's a lot to it. Yeah, that. and why was it necessary to send in foot soldiers if you knew they were there? Just use the cobras or something. How about B-52s? You know, anything. No. <laughs> yeah, you, know, anything. you know, Terry, it's funny. <coughs> you know, I, I never served, and uh, I'm very thankful for what you guys have done, and I, and I really mean that. I don't. I don't want it to sound, you know, <clears throat> kind of just putting a token thank you, but. I'm also thankful that most of the veterans like yourself can be vulnerable. It's not easy talking about this. And what you said earlier, sometimes we compartmentalize this stuff. And, you know, when we talk to Jerry Radelaide and, you know, and others about some of these instances, you know, you're absolutely right. There, There is no reason why you guys should have been put in that position yeah. and yet and yet you you know you guys somehow found the strength to overcome it you know and and so that you would even talk about it today thank you I know I know it was difficult and I, it is difficult because now you know after today you'll probably some of that will try to creep in there and, yeah. and but but it, it was what it was and you you were brave through that so thanks for sh really sharing the truth because guys like me See when I when I hear you and I I get to see some of that it helps me really understand w what was going on if that makes sense yeah you know yeah um, you know my mom and dad told you were kind of on the religious side back then and well they always were but um, so my dad said um, when I got home did you make any promises there <laughs> <laughs> that you that you should keep. Oh. To the Lord, you mean? Like, God, if you wow. did, did, wow. did you? Did you? No. Oh. I, I told myself when I was there in the firefight, shooting and being shot at, that I was not going to say something stupid that I didn't mean or that I wasn't willing to do later. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, some guys we've interviewed, they made that promise. Yeah. 
I mean, there was there was one guy, and he and he said it was my. T he said there was no way we were getting out of it, mm -hmm. and he said, God, if you spare me today, and you know, I mean, we we l joke and laugh, but I mean, he came home and he kept his promise. Yeah, you know, he kept that, and so I get what you're saying. It's yeah. it's a big deal, but yeah, funny. Do you remember John Rarick? Yeah, and he got killed that mm -hmm. day. Yeah, were you anywhere in the vicinity of where that? When I went up to um, where Rios was, yes, it wasn't that far away from where Rarick and a couple of others had gotten taken down right right at the beginning of the ambush. Were you aware of it? No. At that time, you didn't realize it mm -hmm. at the time. No. Okay. And then how did how did they were you one of the guys that went and got Rios and got him back or how how did that work? Um, I don't remember. I I remember carrying some people back to the medevac medevac and body bags and things like that. But I was one of the guys that went out and got the captain who was in went wounded. And I don't know if his RTO got wounded as well. But there were there were at least him was wounded. I helped him drag him out of there. Who was it? I can't remember his name. Oh, oh another guy. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I yeah. Thought, oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I don't know his name. And, and there were, I think there were two or three of us that maybe I can't remember how many there were. Did he name. make it? I think he did. How do you process that? You know, I, I've never asked that question about how, you know, you said you had to drag another guy out. Mm -hmm. And was he, was he alive? Yeah. Okay. How, how, what, what did you do after? Like how do you how does a guy decompress after? Because your your adrenaline oh. is so maxed. Yeah, you're pulling another. You're saving another human being's life. You don't even probably comprehend. It's also flash. Uh, yeah. You know how do do you, do you even have any recollection of what happened after that? Like, do you just go sit down and <laughs> cry your eyes out? Do you just yeah, go get a sandwich? Things. Do you? Play cards. I mean, do you remember any decompressing after that, Terry? I don't. Hmm. I don't remember what we. But did it's after. all. But the answer is all of the above. There yeah, is crime. Yeah. Oh yeah. I yeah. mean, trust me. Not right then. But after. Yeah, yeah. Once you figure out that you're actually still in one piece, and. And I don't think I did that for like ever. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Um, you know. Um, nobody's ever heard me talk about this. What what do you remember after Renegade? What was what was the your the rest of your tour like? Um, we went to Cambodia, and uh, what was it? Uh, May right? Early May, late October, April, early May. Is that when you guys went in and and found all the caches of mm -hmm. weapons and talk mm -hmm. talk? Because I wasn't there. Tell me about that. What was that like? You know, when I was there, they wouldn't. They supposedly we weren't, weren't going into Cambodia. That's right, we weren't. And since we were in Katrik on the boat on the on the border, right, we could see the supply lines running up and down. Isn't that Cambodians. isn't that unreal? That was horrible, horrible. I, <laughs> and you know, you know the Cobra pilots mm -hmm. that came come yes. to the reunion. Right. You know, how many times have I asked them? Right. Why didn't you guys just go? And they wouldn't Figure let them. Out. Right. They wouldn't right. let them. Yeah. Trust me, they wanted to. I'm sure they did. Yeah. But they just wouldn't let them. Well, in, in our location at Cotric, they would, you know, then come across the border and shoot grenades in on to the base almost every evening. Um, anyway, uh, that was uh, Nixon's, um, you know, secret move into Cambodia. Right. So um, that's also a little bit of a blur, but somehow we got from. Kotrick, it seems almost like we went to Kuchi and then back out to the border somehow. They had a staging area out there someplace. I can't remember if we helicoptered in. I think we did. But How far into Cambodia did you guys go? The 30s were landing on a, you know, PSP. Uh, PSP. I don't know. I don't know. One of, the, one of the guys said it was 50 miles. Yeah. I don't know. We went in... Um, and uh, the B-52s were bombing like all night long. Wow! Before we went in, you could, we just we were on the ground. You could, the ground shook. Yep. All night long <laughs> it was weird. Um, 
and uh, yeah, we found the caches. And was there any resistance? Did you guys? I mean, did they put up a fight, or did they just haul out of there? I think, as I remember, they just hauled out. Um, as I remember, I would think the B fifty two bombing would give them an yeah. idea like this probably wasn't going to be a good Don't stick. place to. Yeah. yeah. So we did um, um, have one incident that I remember that uh, we noticed these big scorpions. They're black scorpions mm -hmm. there. And uh, one of our guys at night, we set up and uh, he was bitten mm -hmm. by some scorpions. Mm -hmm. And so we had to medevac him out. Then we had to move after we had the medevac come in. And I don't know whatever happened to him. I think he, he lived. Can but, you imagine how painful that would be? Oh, Those no. things really hurt. Yeah. And they were just like, we, because we had, I don't know if we had gotten over to the side of the road or a pathway or something, and then people were, had seen these like scorpion things and were like, whoa. But then when we set up that night, we didn't realize they were, you know. Oh were my right. gosh. Yeah. Did you guys have a Kit Carson scout? Yeah. Do you remember his name? Bong, maybe? That sounds terrible. I think it might have been Bong. And was he pretty good for you guys? Yeah, I, I think so. I didn't deal with him, really. Um, that may not have been his name. Anyway, um, he seemed good, although some people didn't like him in our unit. And I'm not sure if it just because he was Vietnamese mm -hmm. um, or if they thought he was um, Viet Cong. I think that was the... the it was uh, always an iffy. Yeah. Yeah. And and really you didn't know no. until you got in a fight. Yeah. Yeah. And then how how they reacted or what sure. they did at that point told you the yeah. what you needed to know. Yeah. I know our our Kit Carson Scout, we named him Pete. Mm -hmm. And he was probably one of the best really? soldiers and one of the best human beings I've ever known in my life. Yeah. But he was a very educated, he was a doctor in Whoa. North in North Vietnam, he was a surgeon, yeah. and they he got conscripted. In other words, oh, they sure. came to him and said, you're going into the military and we're sending you to South yeah. Vietnam, or we're sending you to Cambodia and you're going to do surgery in an underground hospital. Wow. And he goes, I don't want to go, I'm, I'm a doctor, I'm a surgeon. Well, do you like your family mm -hmm. just about the way they are? Well, of course, then yeah. that was that. So he went completely against his will. Now, the way the North Vietnamese dealt with people like that is, you know, they used the family as the, sure. as the leverage. But after the guy was was gone, if he didn't perform the way they wanted him to, the family was gone anyway. Sure. And, and they knew that. Yeah. I and mean, these people knew it. Yeah. So he's doing surgery in this underground hospital, and he's just so upset, you know, about what's happened. He decides he's going to boogie Chew and, chew, and chew hoi. I'm just going to say that. And he did. And the Wolfhounds were right on the border. Yeah. It was our, you know, our group. Yeah. And so he came out with a white flag. Yeah. And they, and they took him wherever they take him. Sure. In the little education camp or whatever. And they figured out, hey, this guy's an educated guy. This yeah. is not a, right. just a farmer. And uh, so he carried a medic bag. Mm -hmm. The whole time he was he was with us. Wow! But he was also he'd walk point. He'd get in tunnels. Wow! He was but he was so anti North. Yeah. I mean, it was he just would itch to get in a fight with him. Yeah. Yeah. So he was a good he was a good one. I do remember the a couple of times we had Chu Hoi um, incidents, which worked, worked worked out okay. But I remember the. The whole psyops thing, dropping the leaflets and stuff like oh, that. Oh yes, I'd yep. forgotten about that. Did Did your parents ever send care packages? Oh yeah. What What were some of the goodies you got? So they started off not knowing, like what to put in there, or how to put it in there, whatever. So I think they put in eventually. Uh, started off with just like packing stuff, and then we eventually had them do popcorn. Oh yeah, you know, yeah. So we could eat the popcorn and yeah. also work. I yeah. remember. I, I never got <laughs> they packed it. With, they packed it with popcorn. Yes, yeah. I forgot about that. <laughs> no, that's a fast, <laughs> and it's perfect <laughs> uh, packing. And then you ate the. <laughs> that's <laughs> funny. Yeah. And then You're the first person that ever said that. And I forgot about it. Yeah. 
Um, and so we have cans of sardines and fruit and you know stuff like that. And those those definitely were better than some of the food you ate out on the field. I'm sure. Oh yeah. yeah did I, did you were you there over Thanksgiving or Christmas? No. Okay. No. We we um, not that many times while I was there they would chop her in food. You know. In the Mermac can the it, insulated yeah, cans. And yeah. Yeah. It never was worth a darn, and the, the milk was always about half spoiled. And oh, yeah. I got to where, I, for years, I always shook milk, you know, just because <laughs> it was... To half, see if there was cottage yeah, cheese exactly. in there? Right. Because right. <laughs> um, I had opened it before, and it was like, eh. Yeah. Yep. Um, yeah. Did you take an R&R &R while you were there? No, I could have, but I didn't. Okay. And why, why was that? Uh... I don't know, just waiting, I guess. Pardon me? Just waiting, waited. Okay, no. so you, but you could have yeah. went. Yeah. Okay, and uh, how many months did you serve in the in the Wolf Hunts? Uh, a little over seven, seven and a half. Okay. So here's the uh, interesting part of the story, getting back to the prep school thing. They came and got me one day. <laughs> so, really? Uh -huh. <laughs> Out in the field. Jeez. They called up, said, Lane, chopper's coming in for you. And I'm like, what? I go, yeah. Well, any detail? No, I don't know what it's about. So, and Dale Berg was there too, and because I had talked to him about this, you know, and he go, oh yeah, right, this is going to happen. You got screwed, you know. You're not oh yeah, you know, I can imagine. You're not going to. It's not going to work out for you. So, uh, came in. I was the only person on the chopper. Popped purple smoke. Left. Went back to. Uh, Saigon, I was there like, uh, or I guess it was Coochie or Saigon, I don't know where I went, for like a night, and then they flew me out the next uh, day through the Japan, Alaska thing, went into Oakland, processed, went home, I was home for like a week, and then I was at the West Point Prep School at Fort Will. Fort so you did, when you got on the <laughs> chopper from the field, mm -hmm. You didn't. You still didn't know what it was all about. When did you figure out, or when did they tell you, "Hey, you're going to your prep school"? When I got back to Coochie. Okay. And so then, what was your? What were you thinking? Oh, goody! I'm getting out of here. <laughs> yeah. Pretty yeah. much. Yeah. So, Todd, let's hear about this <laughs> prep school. Well, you, but you never got to say goodbye. No. And I'll, but did that bother you? That theory? was a, that was an issue because mm -hmm. I had no notice, and just literally left. And they're all standing there like, what the hell? Exactly. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, so Good. there was no closure. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. yeah. And never saw them again. Yeah, especially, the especially after such a, a horrible experience. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you know, that, yeah. Yeah. So, tell us about the prep school thing. <laughs> okay, so, uh, now you were a two-year guy. Mm -hmm. You've already used a year at least, mm -hmm. maybe more. So, are you going to go to prep school for a year, or are they talking to you about adding on to your, like, re-upping? I had time to finish the prep school, uh, which I did, well, almost. So, I went into the prep school in the summer of 70, in July, um, and was there until April of 71. What kind of study, or what, what is prep school? It was uh, college. It was a prep school for West Point, so it was algebra, oh, so English. Oh, so just like you were going to college. I was going to college. Oh, for heaven's yeah. sake. Yeah. So they take a certain number of people from then, I don't know how they do it now, a certain number of people from enlisted ranks, a certain number from reserve ranks, and then into the academy, and then a certain number of presidential uh, oh, yeah, sure, sure. Uh, recommendations. So, the reserves and the enlisted went through this program because we were no longer like right out of high school. And uh, it lasted um, a year, right out of a year. And so they kept saying, uh, are you interested, are you still interested in going? Yeah, 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 yeah. So up until April, and then I decided, it was a lot of, not only a lot of studying, but a lot of drill and ceremony. Mm. I mean, which was totally like, I was past that. <laughs> yes, oh yes. We did a drill and ceremony like almost every day. Yeah. White glove inspections. Oh my gosh. Until Saturday morning at noon, we got off and then we 
come back at six o'clock Sunday night. Just super disciplined. Yeah, yeah. Um, so um, very few other Vietnam vets there. It was a pretty good sized school. I mean, probably I don't know a couple hundred people at least. Um, I only knew of a handful of Vietnam vets who had been there, who were, who were there. Um, so uh, up until eight that April. And I decided, you know what, I don't. I think I've had enough of this. So the commandant called me in one more time and said, well, uh, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I said, you know what, I changed my mind. He goes, well, in other words, this is the re-up talk. In other words, no, they're... No, this is, are you going to West Point? But you'd have had to re you'd have had to join. I mean, you'd have had to be a career guy then. Instead yes. of two years, now you're going to commit yourself to... To four years of school and five years more of service. That's what that's what I was getting at. Yeah. So yeah. you you had to commit. Yeah. Yeah. And so I'm like, I don't think I want to stay in the military. And of course, he stood up and said, "What?" And uh, I said, "Yeah, I think I just I've run my course in the military. Maybe had it not been to Vietnam. Yeah. Oh yes. Had, oh. I, had I you know come here first? Sure. Sure. I think I might have been more." Uh, ready, but I said I just don't think I can go through that. As, as good a school as I'm beginning, you know, I just don't think I'm ready for that. So, so when you when you came <laughs> out of the military, did you go back to school or college? Yeah. yeah. Did you get credit from the from the prep school towards your credits in college? Never even asked about that back then. No. Okay. I don't know if I could have or not. But anyway, so from uh, in mid or late April, I guess it was. Uh, within a day, my stuff was out of the barracks because they didn't want me fraternizing. Oh no, you else. you did contaminating the rest <laughs> of them. Yeah, so I moved, uh, you know, down the block to an empty barracks with a Unbelievable. other transitioning people. Sure. And within a couple of days, I was at um, Fort Hood, Texas. So I processed in there, and the guy who ran the battalion was Lieutenant Colonel Colvin. And um, I don't remember if it was like, you know, Dale said, Old Ironsides or Hell on Wheels, one or the other. I was in one of those units. And so I processed in, and the guys in the office were like, hey, you came from, you know, blah, blah, blah. Said, yeah, he goes, well, we got two jobs open. We've got a lifeguard and a Jeep driver. And I said, well, you know, I don't know. I've, I've had, you know, Red Cross life-saving thing. You well, know. that's a good fit. Yeah. So the colonel. Did you say, are there women at the pool? <laughs> yeah, it's all men. So the uh, the colonel steps out of his office and said, I think he'll be a Jeep driver. I'm like, I think I'll be a Jeep driver. <laughs> he was a West Point graduate. Oh. And uh, for the next, you know, a couple of months, all I heard was, you should probably change your mind. I can oh, get my you, gosh. I can get you back in. You know, I know people there. Wow. But anyway, it was a good, it was a good couple of months. Um, with him and got to know his family and drove his Jeep all over the place wow. and you know kept that thing shiny and you know passed all these inspections and he was happy as hell and yeah so anyway um, <coughs> I left uh, in mid June on a like a little bit of an early out to go back to college so, okay and I did finish college yeah okay and then uh, I changed my major though. Pardon me? I changed my major. So I was a math and chemistry major when okay. I started. I was a psych and social major in counseling when I got out. Mm -hmm. And that was because of my experiences in the military. Well, I'll be darned. Yeah. So did you go then to a four-year college? Mm -hmm. Same school I was at before. Where did you go? Southern Illinois University. Okay. Campus. You got your degree, and then did you just go right into the workforce? Um, I worked at a veterans service center in Alton, Illinois. Okay. It was a um, grant-funded group of Vietnam veterans uh, who did service uh, work for, uh, like a VSO type work. Oh my gosh! Yeah. Um, for the state of Illinois, funded it, and um, I worked on something called the Bad Paper Project. People getting out with discharges they didn't deserve. Oh. So I helped people uh, upgrade discharges. Hmm. And I did that for about a year. They went back to graduate school. Man, you saved a lot of guys' benefits for them. Tried, yeah. I mean, absolutely. Yeah. Because if you get the wrong discharge, you're, you're out. You're done. Yeah, yeah. And of course, it's a horrendous process. When did <laughs> when did you uh, 
meet your wife? Um, later on, I want to. I've been married to her 21 years. Um, you know, lots of things happened in between. No kids, uh, any place else. But did my, you? Were you married before? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, and so um, I met Jill through some friends when I was working at a utility company in Springfield, Illinois. And uh, we got together and I moved to Houston to work and she came down and then we got married and it's been a long story after that. Yeah. But, uh, so we had, she had an adopted daughter and um, so... What's her name? Grace. Okay. And so I adopted her when we got married and then we have a son called Jonathan um, who we had biologically. So mm -hmm. we have two kids. Well, oh, that's wonderful. Yeah. And what are those kids doing today? Well, Jonathan is 19, so he's in college, and uh, Grace graduated from college and just is finishing up her master's this year, uh, this semester, and she teaches uh, sixth grade math at a school in Edwardsville, Illinois. If Jonathan called you and said, Dad, <laughs> you know where I'm going with yeah, this? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> My wife would not have it. She would have nothing to do with it, because I have asked him, I said, you know, Jonathan, you know, there's recruiters that come around the colleges once in a while. You could go to one of the academies. I said, you're smart. He's a smart kid. Yep. I said, you could go to one of the academies, get a great education. You like engineering, which is what he's going to do. I said, you would have a great engineering degree from like West Point or someplace. And, but I said, uh, you know, it's totally up to you. And uh, Jill doesn't want to have anything to do with that conversation. So, and he's not interested. But I just want to let him know there was an option out there. I would never, I don't tell anybody I deal with in my job now to go like back into the military or into the military. I just said, hey, it's a personal choice. Oh, yeah. It worked out well for and me. It, and it is. But, I mean, and yeah. I mean what, what are you doing now, Terry? I, I work in a community college and veterans office. Mm -hmm. um, I run career services and veteran services at Lewis and Clark Community College mm -hmm. in Godfrey, Illinois. Um, so I, I'm an advocate for veterans there, liaison between them and departments and faculty, um, help them with issues and uh, refer them to uh, other organizations in the community that can help them, VA vet centers and, and things like that, help them with uh, financing if they need something, uh, with financial difficulties. We have financial literacy training courses and things like that. And earlier you and I were talking, you're 70. Mm -hmm. And you're just going to keep working. Yeah, I think so. As long as the body yeah. and soul and mind and yeah, yeah. So you must really like what you do. I do. It's it's really, it has also brought back a lot of memories for me to deal with these young vets. Uh, before this, I worked practically my whole adult life in the energy industry. Um, retired from a utility company, and uh, what kind of a job did you have there? Customer service. I was a customer service rep for uh, residential, commercial, and then industrial engineer for uh, commercial, I mean mm -hmm. industrial customers. And then I did power marketing, sold bought and sold power uh, on a grid basis, you know, megawatts type thing. Um, and so um, when I got this job, I was finished with that. Uh, and Dealing with these vets brought back a lot of memories for me. Oh, yes. Not all good, <laughs> but certainly brought yeah. things to the surface that I hadn't thought about in many, many years. Mm -hmm. Of course, one of the first things they say when they walk in is, did you serve? Yeah. What was your MOS? Oh, no, yeah. <laughs> they want to know. They want validation. They, they want, want validation, they, they they want want validation Yeah, right? they want to know yeah. before they open their mouth. Exactly. Oh, that's yeah. a fact. So yeah. that, that helps. Did you stay in touch with any of the guys you served with when you came home? I did not, and one of the things, like Tim mentioned, it was an abrupt ending. I had, I didn't have any, um, I, I guess I could have thought in advance, but I didn't have anybody's address, names, nothing. Um, the only person that ever reached out to me, um, whenever Jerry got involved with you guys. Was, that was the first? That was the first. So, so just a few years ago. What was what were you thinking when Jerry called you on the phone? I think the first couple of times he called him, like I don't, thanks, but no thanks. <laughs> <laughs> it's nice the guy as he is. I just I just was not interested in. Yeah. Well, and plus it just 
like boom, it hit yeah, you. Yeah. You just like, didn't have a chance to process it or yeah, anything. I don't think I want to talk about this or be around people who want to talk about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, and then and then you went to a reunion. Yeah. And tell, tell us a little bit about that re first reunion. The first one I went to was in Branson four years ago, I guess, or however long it's been. Then I went to the next one in Tulsa. I'm going to the one in Tulsa. That's mm -hmm. how far back I, yep. I go. So um, Jerry talked to me several times on the phone before I went and kind of gave me an idea how it's going to be. And he mentioned some names that he that had been there and were going to be there. And I'm like, oh, I remember Dale and I remember this guy, you know. So, Tempesta, um, did you remember him? Yeah. Jerry? Yeah, I remember Jerry. And uh, um, I said, okay, well, I'll try this, you know. Well, it was also um, an emotional time for me. Of course. Um, and uh, but it was good. I think it's cathartic oh, for yes, me, and I yes. think probably probably needed this actually after all these years. So, yeah. Um, it's worked out really well. I appreciate you guys doing this. Oh, this yeah. and the reunions. I sure. Mean, it's made a difference for me. That's that's awesome. What I'd like to do is I'd like to have you look right in the camera and tell us what does your wife mean to you? <laughs> um, gosh, that's a tough one. Um, my wife is my partner. Um, she, um, I mean, I can say I love her and, and I do, but she is um, um, an integral part of me as I am today. Mm. Um, uh, she has helped me uh, come to terms, I think, with things that I haven't dealt with. She has watched me go through this reunion thing and uh, dealing with veterans and uh, getting emotional. Even when I talk to the board of directors and I talk about these young vets, it's very emotional. I can see myself yes. you know, there pretty easily. Um, they have a lot of issues. Um, not just um, PTSD and TBI, they have financial issues. They have all kinds of things going on with them. Not all of them. They're not all you know, in trouble. But um, it's nice to be able to be there for them. And she's helped me uh, realize that, that I can do that and get through that. And um, she has helped me have two children that um, I, for a long time in my life, didn't want to have any kids for whatever reason. I just didn't think I wanted to be a parent, but fell in love with her and her daughter, Grace. Uh, and then we decided to have Jonathan, so uh, changed my life. Oh, I'll bet. Yep. Yep, that's when you that's when you became complete. I think you're right. That's yeah. that's when that's when you became complete. Yep. So in the in the uh, let's see what was my thought there. It was about it was about veterans. Uh, you know when you deal with these. Oh, I know what I was going to ask you. Do you have any dealings with the vet? What they call veterans court now? We have in Madison County, Illinois, Veterans Court, and um, can you just explain a little bit because a lot of people don't even know about that. Yeah, uh, there's a lot in St. Clair County, which is right next door as well. Um, so a Veterans Court is uh, is a process outside of the regular processing of a person who has um, committed a crime or had a drug offense or um, I don't know the exact parameters, but if the person is a veteran and identifies himself or herself at the beginning of the process, um, they can ask to be processed through Veterans Court as opposed to the regular court system. And uh, in that system, they get counseling, they get assistance in different ways, um, they get support, um, and they have, they have set up um, benchmarks that they have to meet. And if they meet those and get through the process, and it's not like a week, it's like months, um, but it's personalized for them, then they can have that charge um, wiped out completely. Oh, wow, yeah. Which, for a veteran, is really, oh, you know, for their future. Huge. I mean, it's, it's a huge deal. So, Terry, as we wind up our discussion over your lifetime, what is, 
as you think back, what is your definition of a hero? Um, I guess I set the bar kind of high for hero, um, personally. Um, so, um, I think we may have watered down that a little bit lately. Um, everybody who served is not necessarily to me a hero. I don't mean that in any negative way at I, all. I understand what you're saying. Uh, it just means, and I think a lot of the younger people that I talk to even feel the same way, a lot of the vets, um, I think it's it's someone who does you know above and beyond, not just serve. Mm -hmm. So um, again, I don't mean to disrespect to anybody who sees it differently, but I think um, it's it, it's a little unfortunate that we use that word a little bit, I think, too easily these mm -hmm. days. Um, everybody needs to be um, honored for their service. I think that is a given. So if we're talking about military especially, I think it's someone who goes above and beyond the normal. Mm -hmm. you know. And then what does the American flag mean to you? Um, it's definitely a symbol of, um, of um, greatness of America. It is um, thought about much like that. Uh, it, it is, um, I'm struggling here. Uh, I think it deserves um, a lot of respect. I think a, a lot has gone into the, um, the flag over the years in terms of what it stands for, mm -hmm. freedom, mm -hmm. um, uh, human rights, that kind of thing. I think that, uh, again, I don't, I think we see a lot of flag waving these days and I hope it's all in the right mm -hmm. purpose and not just to draw attention to the flag in order to, for a commercial reason sure. or something like that. So I guess um, for those of us who have served, I think it probably means maybe something a little different than maybe does to somebody who just wants to put it on their logo. Sure. Thing. Anyway. And then this video, hopefully, is going to be seen by people in your family for generations to come. <laughs> and that's the purpose. Mm -hmm. What advice do you have for not only this generation, but for the generations that come after. What advice do you have for them? Wow. I don't consider myself to be a philosopher. Uh, I think um, respect other people, be kind, be considerate, you know, some of those basic things, um, listen, uh, give positive feedback, uh, try to set an example, you know, um, teach by doing, setting an example that way. Um, I think there's such a thing as just being a, a good human being to other people, you know, the old thing about, you know, treat others and you treat yourself, I got my yeah. For the grandkids, great-grandkids, great-great-grandkids that you may never meet. <laughs> Do you want to just look in the camera and say I love you? Definitely love you. Hope you have a good life. <laughs> Terry, thank you my friend. Thank you. Appreciate thank it. you so much. This has been very, very valuable. Not not only to me, but to anybody that watches this, this uh, video. So, my friend, thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks, Tim.